Hey, welcome to Content Creation Made Easy. I'm your host, Jen Liddy. Today is the second of a two-part series that I did based on a ton of research I did over the fall of 2023. I had a few clients coming to me saying that they had written a book or wanted to write a book or in the middle of writing a book and they wanted help with their marketing. So I had dived into researching everything about book writing, book marketing, book publishing, and I learned that it's an enormous, enormous world. But I wanted to share with you two of the biggest takeaways that I learned in my research because you might be thinking, I have a book in me. And it might be a nonfiction book filled with your expertise or your signature framework or your story. Whatever book might be broiling inside you, one of the things that could keep you from doing it is the belief that I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if people need my book. I don't know who to hire. So in the previous episode, right to this one, I did an interview with Annie Schiffman, who is a media and uh, she owns a media company and she's a social media strategist. And she wrote a book called Simple Social Media. In that episode, we talked all about, you know, why somebody would write a book, what it actually takes to write a book and to get your ideas down. We also talked about the framework that she outlines in her book, uh, the pager method for simple social media. But beyond writing your book, there's all, there's this enormous world of people who can help you with it. And there's all different kinds of, you know, people that can help you before, during, and after. And I wanted to focus on the kind of people that will help you during, which are editors. And so today I'm talking to my friend, Ricky Heller. Ricky and I have known each other for a long time, and she is an author, a best selling author, and she's written several different kinds of books and been her books are very popular, but she's now uh, an editor and she talks about the different kind of kinds of editors that you might need or encounter as you're writing your book. Like the difference between, you know, copy editing and line editing is something that we dive into here. Ricky is a developmental editor and what the hell does that mean and why would you use that? But basically when you're writing a book, you're probably going to need to partner up with some people to help you, you know, stay on track. Um, weed out the words that don't need to be there, keep things really cohesive and clean and focused. And that's what Ricky and I talk about today, the different types of people who can help you in the middle of writing your book. This is a valuable conversation if you're thinking about, you know, who do I even hire to help me get these ideas out and make sure they're cohesive so my audience can understand them. That's what you're going to want to listen to today. Enjoy and let me know what you think. Leave a comment or a review. And I so appreciate you being here. And I really enjoyed doing this little deep dive into the world of books and publishing and authorship and all things that have to do with it. And if you have a book in you for 2024, I just want to say, you know, put it on your list of things to make real because it is 1000% a possibility for you. So many people are writing books and getting them published and getting them sold. Don't think you can't do it. Don't count yourself out. Okay. I'll see you on the other side of the conversation. Bye. Hey, hey, welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. I'm Jen Liddy, your host. And today I have an old friend with me who's now a colleague in the book arena, Ricky Heller. Ricky, I've asked to be on because she has, she wears a couple of different hats in the book world. She is not only her own published author, but she is a developmental editor and a book coach. And so I want to just tell you about Ricky because it's pretty in incredible. Um, she not only works collaboratively with clients to help them create their clear writing and capture their voice. Um, she is a doctor, by the way, and she has four books. She has authored four books, including Sweet Freedom, which P.S. was recommended by Ellen DeGeneres. Um, her work has appeared in countless magazines and newspapers like Shape, Clean Eating Magazine, The Globe and Mail, The Toronto Star, BuzzFeed, One Green Planet, The Huffington Post. So we're talking to somebody who has some clout here. And I wanted to talk to Ricky because I want to talk about the experience of, you know, what it what it is to be a developmental editor and a book coach. And then also from her perspective on the inside what is it like to have to market your own books? Um, so we're going to talk about all of these things today. So Ricky, I just want to say thanks for being here. I'm excited to, to dive in. Oh, thank you for having me. What a great intro. <laughs> <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, let's start by talking about your, well, there's kind of a long journey because you are an author and then 
from the book came some of your coaching work. And then now you're working on the other side, helping other people, right? So I would love to hear about just like where, how you got to this place of being a book coach and a developmental editor. I'll, I'll try to keep it short because, you know, I'm old. <laughs> I have a long history. But, I know. You know, so I think, as you know, I taught English at the college level for like 25 years. And then because of my own illness, I studied holistic nutrition and I started coaching in that field. And, mm -hmm. and I did that for like 12 or 14 years. And I had quit my, my teaching job in, in the interim. And then around the second year of the pandemic, I, I just had this moment. I was clearing through my computer files because, you know, we were all home and had time to do that kind of stuff. And I came across this folder that said drafts on it. And when I opened it up, there were like three dozen short stories and articles that I had started years before, planning to publish, never did anything with. Mm -hmm. And it just literally hit me like a lightning bolt. Like, I have to get back to words. I have to get mm -hmm. back to writing something in that field. And because of my own history teaching English, it made sense to do editing. And then mm -hmm. just serendipitously, I was having a conversation with a colleague. She had just finished a book and she said, I want you to edit my book. And so I said, okay. <laughs> and that's kind of how it all started. But I just knew I had to get back into the, the field of words, words and writing. And as I've been doing this, I realized that this really is the area that I was meant to be working in. So um, I've been now doing this for just uh, almost three years and absolutely loving it. When you say she wanted you to edit it, when I think of editing, I think of one thing, but you're a developmental editor, which is another thing. So what, what yeah. when somebody says, I want you to edit my book, what does that mean? Well, I think she meant what most of us think of, which is I want you to correct the sentences and the grammar <laughs> and make sure, you know, which I actually ended up doing for her book. And and that just helped me realize I don't want to be a copy editor. <laughs> okay, copy <laughs> but, editing. Right, right, yeah. right. But I also did the developmental editing. So what that means is it, it, you think of somebody taking like a bird's eye view of your book and looking at the structure and the organization in general. So if someone comes to me with a complete manuscript, and we can talk about what happens if they don't have any writing done yet, but if they already have a complete manuscript, that's where developmental editing comes in. And so I would read the whole thing and provide feedback in terms of how does it hold together? What about the organization? Maybe this chapter needs to be moved over here, or are there um, parts of the, the book that really are superfluous? We don't they don't serve any particular purpose because I think what happens so often is, and it's a cliche to say, but especially with first time authors, because like when I wrote my first book, you don't know if you're going to write another one. So you want to put everything you know into that first book, right? Oh God, so a crazy. developmental editor will say, mm, this doesn't really help forward the message. You know, let's take this out or let's, we're missing something here. So all of those kind of structural things. And then the other thing that a developmental editor will do is look at the voice coming through. So does this sound like you? Or is it because you think you need to be formal when you're writing? Or mm. um, maybe in this part of the book, you're using a lot of industry jargon, but not in the rest of the book. Let's make it sound like you, the person, and make the writing as clear and concise as possible so that it's a really um, easy read for the reader and flows smoothly from beginning to end. So you have to have a brain that can work on a project kind of from 30,000 feet up and see yeah. all of the parts and like pluck this part out and put it back over here. Um, the yeah. other thing I imagine you'd have to do is uh, people are very precious about their writing. I know it's a very vulnerable thing to share. How you, so, you, so then you have that other piece of like having to give this news about like, well, this isn't quite working. We have to move this around. Is that hard too? Yeah. And I mean, I think that's where my previous coaching experience really comes uh, into play. Yeah. Being able to speak to someone in a way that is really mindful of their feelings. like you, you. And the other thing to keep in mind is with a developmental editor, it's very different from a copy editor where it's correct grammar or incorrect grammar, or correct spelling or incorrect spelling. With a developmental editor, really, I'm providing my suggestions for what I think will improve mm. the book and make it the best it can be. But ultimately, and always, it's the author's final decision of what stays and what goes. You know, how it has that, to feel good for them. How is that different from you, the hat you wear as a book coach? So a book coach is, it's quite different because a book coach works with someone who's developing the book, who's okay. writing the book in process. And it can go from, you know, the point where 
I just have this vague idea. Maybe I want to write a book. I'm not sure what I want to write about. Mm -hmm. I can help people to take that chaos, you know, of ideas Mm -hmm. and create some order and come up with, you know, I'm going to say table of contents because people hate the word outline, (laughs) but it's an outline, (laughs) you know, like a way to organize your ideas so that you have this plan and then you can go off and write it. Um, And we work that way with people. But the other thing that I do is in process. So I think writing a book, people understand it's going to be, and you know, it, it, you're taking on a pretty major endeavor. But I think what happens is like any new project, I think about, you know, exercising and, gen- you know, joining the gym in January, we're really, really excited when we get the idea and lots of motivation in the beginning. And then as we're going at it every single day, every single day, we might lose some of that initial uh, momentum. And what a book coach can do is keep you on track, keep you mm-hmm. writing consistently, It's very similar to the developmental editing in the sense that we provide feedback as you go and there's a chance to discuss, you know, what you're doing, but also really support, cheerleading, guidance, all of those things and accountability. Accountability. Yeah. So then I wanted to move into talking about all of this work that goes into writing the book from the ideation to the actual keeping the momentum going, getting the feedback, not melting down when you get the feedback. Uh, And then you have this product. And then you have to get it out into the world, which is where my huge interest comes in, because I feel like this is a place where uh, there's a little bit of like a field of dreams happening here. If I build it, they will come situation. Like I've I've got the book out there. Why isn't it just selling itself? And so I would love to hear you talk about your experience with the marketing piece, the beyond like, yes, there's the launch, but all of the promo stuff that happens before, during, and after the book is launched, I would love to hear about, because I know you've been uh, self-published and also traditionally published. So I would just love for you to talk about the marketing piece. For sure. For sure. I mean, it's very similar as you were saying, like if I put up, if I slap up a website with my business and I don't do anything to promote it, who's going to find the website, right? Mm -hmm. It's very similar with the book. People do not just come. You have to make them aware of the book. But the one thing I'll say initially is that I think I didn't realize, and most people don't realize, is marketing has to begin even before the book is finished, yeah. never mind published. The, when you start writing your book, I would say that's the best time to start your marketing. So How many of your you- clients actually do that? I'm just curious. Sorry to interrupt, but I really wanted to like just put a pin in that because I, I hear this a lot from people in the book industry. Mm-hmm. The best time to start marketing is when you start writing. But how many of your clients like actually have the brain space or energy to think about that? Um, interestingly, I mean, it depends on the client. So okay. most of my clients are people who run online businesses. Uh-huh. And so they're well aware of, you know, the fact that they need to make people uh, aware of the book. So right. one of my clients, for instance, I'm thinking of one of my first clients, she started talking about it almost immediately. She has a podcast as well. She started talking about it on her podcast, but it's just seeding the idea for people, right? So you you leave little clues here and there that I'm working on something really exciting for you guys, you know, mm-hmm. or um, as it gets closer and closer, I can't wait to share my book with you. There are things like the cover reveal that come mm-hmm. out, yeah. you yeah. know, yeah. that kind of yeah. thing. So if you, you know, you and again, because when I did this for myself with my self-published book, I didn't know any of this stuff, to be honest. So it was really very organic what I did. Mm -hmm. At the time, I had uh, my blog was pretty popular, my food Mm -hmm. blog. So I had a pretty large audience that had asked me for this first cookbook, Sweet Freedom. And so I just, I mean, I, I, it was instinctive. I created a, um, a, like a wait, an interest list for the book. So people sent me uh, their emails. If they were interested in the book, you can create a wait list or an interest list that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I also asked for people to help me launch it. So like a launch team, and we had a private Facebook group, and I gave them some private uh, Zoom. I don't even know if it was Zoom at the time. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I gave them some private videos on how to prepare some of the recipes oh, yeah. or, or, you know, like special recipes just for them that no one else got. I think there was an ebook at the end that None of the the people who purchased the book would receive, but only the launch team received. And with my first book, um, I'm trying to remember now. Actually, I think I'm confusing the two. But one of the books I had um, like about 100 um, other bloggers who were on the list to help me with the book. So if you have contacts, yeah, that was, and again, I mean, that was really the heyday of food blogs. So I'm not sure that 
I'm not even sure that people would still be doing that same sort of thing. You might want to find other outlets, but the idea is to tap your network as much as you can to help promote the book and to just talk about it. And um, so th- this is even before the book is published. Yeah. And then once the book is either published or very close to publication, that's when you can send out the arcs, the reader versions of the book who, you know, before mm-hmm. publication and people can either, you know, write about it on their blog, talk about it on social media, share their excitement for the book coming out. You can ask your audience to do that for you and just, you know, have some giveaways and people yeah. will be interested in that kind of thing. So it's leveraging your own network as much as you possibly can. And and, and this would be, I would say this would be whether self-published or publisher published. That's a good thing to do. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about that. I'm finding from people I'm talking to that there is a miss, uh, I wouldn't say like, uh, not a mistake, but like uh, a misassumption that people are making that if you are more, tra- if you are traditionally published, that you can count on your publishing house doing the marketing for you and doing the heavy lift. And I know that you've got experience on both sides. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, don't count on that. I'll <laughs> say if you're JK Rowling or Stephen King, maybe, mm-hmm. but here's the thing. Pub- the publishing industry itself has changed so much since um, print on demand came into play and eBooks and all this kind of thing in the old, like I can even tell you the, the difference between when I first started blogging as a food blogger and today. So, okay. uh, or when I published my last book, I remember one of my colleagues when things were just starting and they, you know, some of the first food bloggers were getting books published with publishers. They would have tours across the U S where they'd go to bookstores and sign books and whatnot. The publisher would pay for them to travel around and do that. By the time my books were published, I think my last um, uh, cookbook was published in 2015. Um, None of that, nothing like the, nothing was covered by the publishers, okay. you know? So if you wanted to do a book tour, it was it's coming. Yet. Yeah. And so because they're now so overworked, they've fired, you know, they don't have as many staff, they, their budgets are smaller and there's so much competition. Um, like I think I was, as I was saying to you before, when your book comes out, there's like a three month window during okay. which the publisher will promote your book mm-hmm. and perhaps a little bit leading up to that. So they will do their best to get you coverage in print media, on, you know, radio, television, whatever it may be, podcasts. Um, But don't forget that their PR person on staff is also promoting every other book that came out at the same time. You know, there's like they have cycles where, you know, your editor as well, like when I work with someone as a developmental editor, I'm their editor. They they can contact me anytime. We can exchange emails. We have personal feedback all the time. Mm-hmm. When I was working with the developmental editor who worked on my books with the publisher, I would sometimes email her f- with a question I wouldn't hear back for a week wow. because she's overwhelmed. Sure, just and sure. it's not their fault, right? Sure. S- so in this case, you know they'll do their best, but whatever comes of it comes of it. And I think it's different depending on your book's topic, how popular the topic is, how much the public is interested in it, your platform, you know, how much they want to invest in you as a writer. Um, But at the end of the three months, it's like, like you're off the cliff. It's over. That's it. (laughs) They lose your number. (laughs) Yeah, there's no more. (laughs) Um, And so, for instance, my book, Living Candida Free, which was the last one that came out, I think it's it, uh, until recently, be, and and it's because I've stopped talking about it. It was it remained in like the top ten for Candida books on Amazon okay. because I would mention it on my stories, or I would be yes. cooking something at home and say this comes from Living Candida Free, and so somebody would buy it that week, or right. you know people would would continue to hear about it. Um, and certainly, you should be doing that kind of thing. You should mm-hmm. be reminding your readers that your book exists. Um, this is a little bit off topic, but just to give you an idea, I don't know if you've read the success, uh, the success principles by Jack Hanfield. And yeah. I think it's just, so, you know, he's the chicken soup for the soul oh, yeah. mm-hmm. author. Um, and he and his co-author, which no one seems to know he had a co-author, Mark Victor <laughs> Hansen, who is not quite so public. So Mark. Jack Canfield wrote a book called the success principles. And in it, it's all about how to be a successful entrepreneur, but he talks about how they marketed chicken soup for the soul. So how they got it published was one story. It took forever. Nobody wanted it. Finally, they got it published and it was like a smashing success. Most people think it hit the New York Times at that point because it was such a success. But what they actually did was they marketed it 
themselves at a grassroots level. And when the book came out, I mean, it sold, but it wasn't what they had hoped for. So the two of them agreed that I think it was each of them each week for one year. So every week for one year, they were going to give a copy of the book to five people that they felt could share it with someone else. Mm -hmm. Even if it was just their barber or the guy who, you know, um, runs the, the newspaper stand or anybody who might enjoy the book who could then tell somebody else. And after doing that for a year, it shot up to number one in the New York Times bestseller <laughs> list. Oh so God. even they had to do the, some legwork and work on it, right? Yeah. And if you do that kind of thing, then your book will become known. And that's how you get your book into the hands of people who can, you know, then bring it to number one on the New York Times bestseller list. When you talk to your clients, whether it's as a developmental editor or the book coach client, when w- does talking about marketing come into your conversation with them? And and I would love to hear what what some of their thoughts are when you do bring it up. Yeah, I mean, it depends. Obviously, it's like some of my clients have um, ended up acquiring uh, contracts with mm-hmm. you know traditional publishers, mm-hmm. in which case they're still working with them, and they. Uh, I, I think the two. So one of my clients who has a pretty big contract. I, I think they're going to invest quite a bit in her in her mm-hmm. marketing. So I haven't heard from her. Um, but other other clients, so the one who was in the New York Times, for instance, mm-hmm. um, she did, I think she hired someone to help with her marketing when she was first published. And so we did have a discussion about what's the best way. You know, she had a pretty big network because of her podcast and she has a membership and so on. But so she did definitely leverage everything that she could do. But mm-hmm. at one point, she also wanted to try to get into larger outlets. And so she, I think she hired a PR person. Right. And I, I think I told you that I did as well. Right? Yes. This, yes. Um, I wanted to talk about the, so PR publicist, are these interchangeable uh, words for the same type of help? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a PR firm and you hire a publicist from the PR firm. Um, gotcha. So in my my most recent book, I knew because my previous book had been also with a conventional publisher and I kind of knew how it, you know, how it was going to go. So I decided to hire someone and I hired someone I could afford to, you know, the extent of my budget. Yep. I'll just say there, you could spend an unlimited amount of money on a, I've heard that on a publicist because they usually have a retainer, a certain amount for, let's say a three month period or even a one month period you pay them, but here's the thing. They never guarantee that anything will happen. (laughs) And it's interesting. I just heard from a PR firm that contacted me that wanted to see if I wanted to work with them that has a model where they don't get paid until you get placements. Ah, And I thought, very smart because, um, because again, they can't guarantee. So when I hired the first person, she was great at getting like bloggers to talk about my book. In, this, in the most recent instance, she was someone who had a little more media contacts because it all depends on who their contacts are. Right. So I did get some television spots. I got a few radio interviews, some podcasts. And I think I had one instance where um, if you if you get, if, if a publicist gets you coverage in like a publication, um, usually you do the writing. You would have right. to create the article that they'll then put in there. So I, I think uh, I had one article Previously, I had like, if it's a cookbook, they might publish your recipe and write a little bit about the book. So you can get that kind of Mm -hmm. coverage. But that's really as far as it goes. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I think anything else is up to you. Yeah, I love this messaging because I think it's something that we need to be overt about in in creating awareness for authors that uh, to you, you almost have to create your own edge to to get your book into the hands of readers, which is why you wrote the book in the first place. Mm -hmm. I find that a lot of writers are highly introverted. And so the idea of having to get on social media or maybe having to like glad hand at events can be like exhausting to them. But um, I feel like you can make a marketing plan that works for your personality. I was wondering what your experience with that was. Absolutely. I was going to say with my first book, I, I I am, I am an introvert, you know, I'm, I'm extroverted when I'm, on screens or on yeah. uh, or at a microphone, but in person, I'm an introvert. And so um, 
what happened there, and this is also one of the things that's great about writing a book, if you have a business or if it's connected to a business, is that it can be a great calling card for you as a professional. So not only do you get in front of the eyes of more potential clients, but in terms of professional um, gigs. Gravitas, so for yeah. instance, I was able to, let's say my first book, Sweet Freedom, um, I did a few workshops where I talked about baking sugar-free or baking without gluten, because that's what the book was about. But you could do a workshop at like a local community center or a small business group or you know anything that's related to your topic. And then from that, you can often find that your sales increase because the people are interested, they've seen you speak, they've heard some of your information, they're happy to buy your book. So always bring your books with you when you go to these places. Right. What some people do if they sign with like a larger group, like maybe you're speaking to, uh, you know, one of these lunch and learns at a business or something where there's mm -hmm. 50 or 100 people in the room, you can make purchasing 50 copies of the book part of that oh, contract. Right. Right, so right, the right. business now is paying for the book, but they're buying that many copies yep. and people sell lots of books that way too. That's so smart. Um, yeah. I One of the things I wanted to dive into a little bit more is the idea of using your book um, not just to sell the book to make money, but also how it can kind of give your business wings or bring people back into your business. Yes, because I think if people are writing the book solely to make some money from the book, they're going to be very disappointed. <laughs> they're going to be eating not ramen noodles. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I mean, I I, I don't know, it, it, you know, if you want to talk about how much you actually earn from a book sure. like in terms of royalties. Okay. So with a self-published book, you actually earn more per book because yes, you're right. publishing it. And the royalty is, for, if you go with something like uh, KDP, Amazon, Kindle direct publishing, it's, I think it's 70% is the royalty per, for the cost of the book. However, with a publisher, and once you have a royalty contract, royalties are often based, first of all, on the wholesale price of the book. And a really good royalty for a first-time author is 10%. Like, that's unbelievably high. Okay. So just to give you an idea, my book, Living Candida Free, I think I was earning about $1.80 per book, something like that. So, you know, you have to sell a lot of books, You're right? You're kidding. Make, yes. No, it's, it's the situation. advanced where people often get the big chunk of yes, money, right? The yes. advanced before. But so um, it's not the money. However, it's the expo. First of all, it's the credibility. Yep. Even though... Um, so many people say they want to write a book. It's still less than 2% of those people who like 80, apparently 80% of the population says they'd like to write a book. 2% of those 80% actually write the book. Okay. And then how, how many publish it, right? So it's a, still a very small number. So mm -hmm. even with self-publishing and all of that. So if you have actually published a book, you're already, you know, raising mm. your status and, and your credibility. So people still want to hear from someone who has published a book. And in terms of being a guest on podcasts, more often than not, if you have a book, it's much easier to get booked on a podcast, sure, for instance, sure, sure, or sure. A television show or all those things. So it really helps with that, with exposure and just people being able to learn about you. I mean, when I was on um, Canada AM, that day I sold a ton of books <laughs> because, you know, it's got 3 million audience or whatever it was. So those kind of uh, events are great for selling books. Or like I said, when you go to a business and you speak to people, you're, you're going to sell more books that way. So it's good for your business in that way. But the thing that surprised me with my most recent book, as you know, was a, called Living Candida Free and I was a Candida coach. I had been working with, you know, people who read my blog or people who knew about me. I did have clients. However, once my book came out, that's when people started contacting me to say, mm -hmm. how can I work with you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I think, first of all, you're reading, when you, if you think about how you read a book, you're usually sitting in your own home. It's just you and the author. It's like a one-to-one right. -one, and you feel like you're really connecting with that human being. Mm -hmm. And I think that allows people to get a sense of whether or not they want to work with you more so than you know, seeing 90 seconds on Instagram or whatever. Yes, it would take yes. longer with something like Instagram. So I did have a, a real surge in my business as a result of having published that book. I just love how um, 
like no nonsense you are about this because I feel that sometimes when people start talking about marketing, especially something that's so dear to somebody like the book that they've written, they can get they can get a lot of feels around it. Maybe resentment, like, oh my God, I can't believe I have to do marketing or it feels so salesy or but I love that you're just like, look, this is something, this is a part of being an author that we need to be talking about a lot earlier in the process. And you've given us some really wonderful, very clear um like tangible ideas that, that obviously work for your personality. Is there any like last piece of advice or something that I haven't thought to ask that you feel like authors really need to know about marketing their book and getting it into the hands of readers? I think it's uh, about marketing, but also about the whole process. The yeah. one thing that I think stops people from finishing the book, from effectively marketing the book, promoting it is they really lose the belief in themselves that they can do this. Once you start comparing yourself to other people or so-and-so's book did this well, and Mm -hmm. who am I to write a book, then you're doomed. So you need to really know that you can do it and that people want to know what you have to say. They really, really do. And they need it. Your your audience, you probably wrote the book because your audience freaking needs to hear it. Exactly. And even if it's the same topic as something that someone else wrote, it's yes. not your perspective on that topic, That's right? right? My, there were books on Candida when I wrote my book, but the people who resonated with my story and my message are the ones who bought my book. And yes. they really needed it. Like like I said, people yeah. who were contacting me to say, how, how can I work with you? Because something in that book touched them and it, it, was, it resonated with their own story. And just to remember that. Yes. There's one thing I want to just circle back to before we leave, which is you mentioned that sometimes in your Instagram stories, you'll mention this recipe. You'll, you'll like, you do such a great job with your stories of like showing people how to cook, you know, the thing that you're cooking just happened to be cooking today. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that you, you reference your book. And I love that just because your book has launched and has been out for a few years, it, it hasn't died. It's not sitting on the shelf. And so you're, you're still talking about it. And I, I wanted to say how important that is that like your, your book has a long life. It really does. Especially nowadays when there's print on demand, it can, it's potential is to never go out of print. So even if someone has a book that they wrote and published five years ago, they could still use help with marketing and launch a marketing campaign and resurrect that book. That's it. Like resurrect your book. I love that. Thank you, Ricky. (laughs) Um, how can people get into your world to either like work with you as a developmental editor or a book coach or buy some of your, one of your four books that you've got out there? The, uh, the most recent ones, the publisher published ones are on Amazon. So if okay. you look me up on Amazon, you'll definitely be able to, to get them that way. Unfortunately, the self-published book is no longer in print. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not promoting that anymore. Um, but I'm at rickyheller.com. That's my website. I'm most active on Instagram and Facebook. So it's just Ricky Heller on Instagram and Ricky Heller page on Facebook. And I would love to hear from you there. Send me a DM or email me. There's, there's a link on my Instagram page to, to, look at my website, see all of my offerings or send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. Awesome. I'm going to put the links in the show notes so that people can, it can be easy for people to connect with you. Thank you so much for all of this, like very transparent and realistic uh, information, because I feel that the, uh, that writing a book can be romanticized and that the whole industry has been a little, like I think, I think it's a little fuzzy. And so that's Mm -hmm. why I really wanted to do this podcast to kind of clarify and simplify and just make this stuff really like tenable for people. Good. Yeah. Because it's so doable. It, yes. It's not rocket science. Yes. Thanks, Ricky. Listener, Thanks. thank you so much for being here today. I'll be back next time talking more about marketing, content, messaging to get your book out into the world and into the hands of your readers. Thanks for being here. Bye.